Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Nos Confundan map, Terra Infinita. So, first of all, I want to thank all of you for the great support I have been uh, given to the first episode where we discussed a lot of what is going on in this map and I really was uh, appreciative of all the support I was given and thanks to a very very neat subscriber I was given the access to a full resolution 15,000 per 15,000 pixel map that shows every single spot of the map both the ones we already checked in the other episode but every single part of the map is HD and you can travel within it at all of the best quality for the map to exist. So on the start we can already see there's big changes. You can see things way clearly. Even places we just covered uh, lightly upon, we can actually see what is going on inside of them. So there's much more to do in this episode. So in the last episode we discovered the lands of Earth. So the known lands of Earth of course. Uh, then we discover the second ring and how to actually come from the set from the lands of Earth to the second ring. Then we looked at the third ring, including Atlantis, Mermaid Islands, and so on and so forth. And then we discovered more lands outside of our planet or our plane of existence. We had the lands of Mars. We saw the lands of the Anunnaki, we saw the lands of the Custodians, we saw the Resurrection Islands or lands, then we saw the lands of Neptune, the Terra de Gilgamesh, lands of Enkidu, uh, Terras de la Delusion or Desillusion, the Pleiades, and so on and so forth. And we even we slightly covered Shangri-La, which in case you don't know, just search up Shangri-La, it's very interesting. So this time I'm going to move both south and westwards to what we discovered in the last episode. So first of all I want to recap the fact that this world which we are living in and we are looking at right now is peculiar in the way that a lot of these lands are unknown for a lot of people and it's very very interesting when you actually come and look at it like the places like the Ancestral Republic last time or the lands of the Anak. I didn't know what they were last time, but now I was uh, um, told that the Ancestral Republic Lorena Seer is where the souls used to go to rebirth. And then the lands of the Anak were where the Nephilim of biblical um, uh, of the biblical books are situated in. So now we can actually move on to new subjects. So first of all, we have the lands of Quayor or Quayoar, I'm not really sure how to pronounce this, but it's probably Quayoar. So the lands of Quayoar are next to the lands of the Custodians and they are to the south of the Anunnaki lands. The lands of the Quayoar are different from many of the other lands we will check in this video because they are easily traversable from these places. You can go here without actually warping reality or going through a wormhole or things like that. You can actually go here from the Anunnaki lands. So the red border shows what we covered last episode and just let's just clear a bit so we can see that realistically you can go from the Anunnaki lands to the lands of Quayor without too many issues. So what are the lands of Quayor actually about? The lands of Quayor are the place of origin of the uh, divine entity called Quayoar. So Quayoar was in the times of pre-colonial America this uh, entity that was believed from a population of Native Americans that lived around the area of the Los Angeles County. Uh, it was believed to be um, a divine entity that made uh, basically everything, so existence itself. So the Tongva people of the lands of the um, near Los Angeles uh, believed that uh, so first there was absolutely nothing, then there was chaos, and after chaos came Quayoar, and Quayoar danced and yelled and did everything he could to create something, and so when he actually did his ritual dance, he managed to create something in existence, which in this case I believe was the first god of I believe wind or the sky. So this was the first creation and from that Veron he created the other gods, the other entities and after that he created the other lands and the 
people that live on them and the creatures that inhabit them, and so on and so forth. But what is interesting is that this is of course just a myth, this is just part of their mythology, but it is said that after creating existence on Earth, Quayuar didn't disappear or stop being believed in, he just went away, he went to what the people of the Tongva believe to be his native place. And so here we, he, we can see the lands of Quayuar as the native place of Quayuar. So the lands of Quayuar, or Quayuar, can be where Quayuar remained after he created existence for the Tongva people. Of course, this is conflicting with all the other creation myths, and of course the biblical one, but it could explain how the lands of Quayuar itself, maybe not Earth, but the lands of Quayuar, came to existence. The lands of Quayuar are divided from the rest of the planes of existence by this very uh, thick fog or mist that makes it very hard and elusive to everybody else to reach. Uh, the lands of Quayuar had no connection to any other civilization, so we do not know whether it's inhabited by some population or if literally just Quayuar and the other divine entities that were believed in by the Tongva people exist here or there is nothing there. So that covers the lands of Quayuar. Then we go to the lands of Atumra and Mut. So we already saw that the Egyptians held very large swaths of knowledge when it comes to the world outside the uh, second ring. And when it comes to this, they already know that where there was a continent inhabited, or at least partially inhabited, by uh, ancient Egyptian div divine entities already in the second ring uh, after Earth, Geminia, which was divided in Geminia South and Geminia North, or Geminia Ra and Geminia uh, Seth. Then we saw the lands of... Uh, where is it? Oh yeah, oh, the lands of uh, Seth here, and the Sea of Horus. Once again, places where the Egyptian gods resided. The lands of Seth being the ones of the god of chaos and destruction, Seth. And the, la the Sea of Horus being the more peaceful and well-governed lands uh, that were under the god called Horus and the other divine entities. But, interestingly enough, we can see here... Oh, sorry lost myself for a second, that we have other lands that have to do with the Egyptian gods, as we have the lands of Mut and the lands of Atumra. So I already uh, mentioned Atumra a couple, couple uh, times again, but Atumra in this case is literally Atum. So Atum was believed to be one of the main uh, gods in ancient e Egyptian mythology. It was one of the most ancient gods, as was Mut. And while Mut was... Um, like a female being, if you want to explain it like that. Mut was believed to be one of the earth goddesses or uh, creation goddesses, while Atum was believed to be the counterpart to Ra. So you know how Ra was the sun god and basically one of the most important gods in all of the Egyptian pantheon? Well, Atum was the counterpart that was sometimes even confused with Ra himself. So some people even thought that Ra and Atum was the, were the same people. And so to have the lands of Mut and the lands of Atum Ra be easily um, searchable and easily traversable, as you can see there is no fog or mist that covers them or where it is near them, you can go right from the lands of the Custodians of the lands of Seth all the way to the lands of Mut or the lands of Atum Ra without any issues. The lands of Mut are literally some islands where uh, the goddess and all her children are believed to be, while the lands of Atum are literally just one single continent that is uh, with a lake inside of it, where is where the serpent Apophis is supposed to reside, Apophis being the serpent that was supposed to destroy all the Egyptian gods when the end of the world happened, similarly to Ragnarok in Norse mythology, while well, this mountain chain here was supposed to be where Ra himself would visit and come when the sun was at its highest, as Ra was the god of the sun. So that explains this, and you can see there is always this connection to mythology and religion of the ancient peoples, as goes for the lands of Quayoar and the lands of Mut and Atum Ra. And this does not stop. But there is one very interesting fact about what the next lands we're going to check out are. Uh, the fact that these lands we're going to check now 
are some of the least easily reachable ones in all of the map we are, we are checking right now. So while the lands of Atumbra, the lands of Mut, the lands of Quayuar are all somehow reachable, if you do the right steps, you can traverse them through uh, the mist and the fog when it comes to the lands of Quayuar, and you can get basically by boat or some other uh, uh, sea-based uh, Me mechanism or technique you can get to the lands of Mut or Atumra, but you cannot do this for the lands we're gonna check on that right now, which are basically all of these lands here. So here we have first of all Heimdall. So you cannot go from any of these places to any of these places, you have to start from the lands of the custodians. The lands of the custodians. Uh, were already explained in the last episode. There were also some comments saying I was wrong, and in that case, just check the comments if you want to know more, since um, the source for the Lens of the Custodians was different from what I expected, but in the end, it still was concept similar to it. And from the Lens of the Custodian, you have to literally just create a wormhole or traverse literally a vast emptiness to actually reach Heimdall. So Heimdall is this land we can see here and you can really see there's something weird with it because there is no like actual land. In fact, Heimdall is only covered by seas and then the only land misses, even if it's not really land, are ice. So Heimdall is the land that is supposed to be a gate for everything else in the Norse pantheon. So Heimdall himself was originally called Heimdall, Heimdallar and he was a god of a uh, surveillance in the Norse mythology. He was the guardian of the kingdoms of the Azi and Vani, and he was the one that um, you can see just guarded the the like the little bridge called Bifrost. Bifrost being the bridge that brought the human world to the world of the ancient Norwegian uh, ancient Nordic gods. So Heimdall as a plane as a plane of existence is literally a gate planet, a gate, a gate land. So you cannot pass from here to here. You cannot do this or this unless you pass here. You have to take this route, otherwise you cannot surpass Heimdall. Heimdall itself is a barren wasteland of cold and ice everywhere. You cannot find any life here but it is the only way to get to the next planes of existence. So if you actually want to go there, you would just want to go there to go away from it, basically. But I don't recommend anyone to visit it. Of course, it's probably impossible to survive it in the conditions we're in like this. Here we have the lands of the final dome. I don't know exactly what these are. I was trying to get information on these, but I couldn't find any. So unfortunately, I don't know what these are. If you know in the comments, let me know. But the important thing about Heimdall is what it brings here. So things first, we have this bridge, literally called Bifrost, which brings to Adu. Adu is a dead plane of existence. It has, while well, it has one star that, um, like one light that shines upon it, it does not have any population, any like livable oceans or seas. It does not have anything. It's more a barren planet than Mars or anything we know in our current position, as it is the land of the dead, literally. Adu means literally the land of the dead. Once you come to Adu, you're expected to be dead, so if you're not dead, you can't survive here. So that's another way wow, the connection between Heimdall and anything else is so hard. So you have to go first through Heimdall, literally a frigid wasteland, and or oceans of nothing, then you have to go to Adu, which is literally nothing, and only then you can reach the important places. So what are these important places I mentioned? Well, first of all are the lands of Tyr. So Tyr was the land of war. So Tyr as a divine entity was one of the gods in the Norse pantheon. He was associated with Mars from the Roman pantheon and Tyr was the was the war god. That was the one that um, looked upon all the wars, all the violence that happened on Earth, and he had the power to change them in something else, or he wanted to regulate it, or even just come into it and fight himself. So what are the lands of Tyr in this concept? As you can see, they are divided into uh, three different firmaments, and these firmaments are different by itself. There was one, only two, only two uh, sources of light, one in the main part, 
and one for everything else in the second ring of Tyr. So the first part of Tyr is inhabited only by the last remaining warriors of the Nordic Ages of Earth. So Tyr, when the Nordic Ages ended upon Earth and uh, the majority of the gods came to Asgard, as we know in the last episode, Asgard itself is a dying land, as you can see here. Many of the people and the gods and the souls that rested upon Asgard had to go somewhere else. And the land they went to in this case is in fact the land of Tyr. This major place, especially this yellow one we can see here. So that is the only place the souls inhabit, while these green areas here are inhabited also by fauna and vegetation and everything else that the souls need to survive as long as Tyr exists. On the other hand, in the other two places we can see here, uh, in this case there is no actual living beings here, but there are guardians that exist as a way to, gu to gate the uh, plane of existence from everything else coming there. So you cannot actually traverse these lands without actually encountering these guardians, since much like the continent of Thoth, which we already covered both in the last video of this um, series and also in the Beyond the Ice Wall series, we know that the continent of Thoth uh, moves around in the second ring and so do the land masses that move around constantly and change their uh, appearance and so are so as guardians of the lands of Thir. Then we have the lands of Baldur. So for those that do not know, Baldur is also once again uh, a, a part of uh, Norse mythology. So Baldur was the god, one, one of the most beloved gods in all of Norse mythology, but not by the people but by the pantheon himself itself so you had literally every god loving in any way balder he was loved by everybody and nobody thought anything bad would happen to balder in all his, on his life but what happened is that odin went to all hellheim which in case it's literally this so it's next on the line to uh, talk about which is the lands of the dead but not the lands that are dead like adu but the actual lands of the dead and he discovered that Baldur was about to die. So Baldur, being beloved by basically any other Norse mythology god or being, almost, emphasis on the almost part, he was in a very bad situation. Because of course, if Helheim was telling Odin that Baldur was about to die, then Odin had to save him. And so he asked Frigg, to, which was the mother of Baldur, of course, once again, a divine entity, so she had a lot of power, and the mother of uh, Baldur, so Frigg, went all the way to ask every single thing in existence, anything, everything that existed, to not kill Baldur. She had anything promise that nothing could co co kill Baldur. But there was one exception. Mistletoe. Mistletoe is a small plant, I'm sure everybody knows about it. It's the one that is like uh, with Christmas and stuff, or not Christmas, I don't remember the, the festivity you have mistletoe in. But anyways, mistletoe was the only thing in existence that did not promise to not kill Baldur. And what happened was that Loki, you know, god of chaos, discord, anything else, he went all the way to get another god, another existence, another divine entity called Hodru, which was blind to take a narrow and a bow and he had the arrow of the bow next to the mistletoe so that the arrow would hit Baldur once Holger, Holger, once Holger managed to hit Baldur. So what this means is easy, okay? So this is a long mythology and you can check it online, it's very easily available. But what this means, in the map, of course, is that Boulder as a planet is linked up with Hell. So, Boulder is the living part that instead Hell isn't. So, Boulder is literally a lush and extremely civilized planet. You can find any sort of life form here from earthly beings, what we know, like animals and plants, but also anything related to Norse mythology, so you can find the, the Aesir Devani here, much as you could find the war, the war gods and the 
um, souls of the dead war like warriors and humanity in the lands of Thir, you can find anything else in Baldur. Of course, with Asgard dying, it also makes sense that some gods rely on Baldur as a uh, as a plane of existence to establish their roots in. But while Baldur remains this livable place, Hell or Helheim is not the same thing. Hell is literally the lands of the dead. But differently from Aru, where death itself is the only thing that happens there, basically because there's nothing alive, Hell is literally full of souls. The souls of the people that believed in Norse mythology, Norse religion, when, when they existed on Earth, and they were sent to Hell. Which in our language is literally Hell, like the biblical version of Hell, but in the language of the Nordics, it's Hell. And in this case, it's right here. The god of Hell is actually a goddess and is called Hell or Hela, and she governs the souls of the damned and the dead. It's not a very nice place to be in, let me tell you. So that covers most of this part. Then we have places like Iduna. Once again, not really sure what Iduna is. Iduna might be, and I'm not sure about this, but it might be where the basically all the seeds and trees and plants that existed in the earthly firm uh, origin from. So if you don't know, Idun, also called Iduna in this case, was another person in Norse mythology, a goddess associated with apples and youth, and there were like poems and sources of every kind that called about Iduna and how she originated from somewhere so far away, far away and she gave basically birth to anything that had to be with nature and plants on earth. So in this case Iduna might either be this, so the place of rest of the goddess, or it might be something completely else. It's also associated with uh, an asteroid chain that exists in somewhere. I'm not really sure where it exists, but it exists probably, and that could be translated in literally thousands of islands as it is on this map, with a couple of places where maybe some civilization exists, but I'm not sure. Following, we have the lands of Caligula. Uh, in this case, these are the lands that are connected from the lands of the Custodians to all we saw today. I think Caligula is the place where the ones that escaped the lands of the custodians went to live, but eventually the custodians themselves reached there and it was over for the people that went to Caligula. So it's probably not inhabited anymore and it's not really a safe place to be in. So once again, not recommend you check it out, differently from Iduna or anything else. So of all the ones we checked today, the probably most interesting ones are Heimdall, the lands of Tyr, Baldur, maybe Hael, Iduna, something like that. Quayuar was also very interesting. Okay, so let's check and add these things on the parts we actually covered in the map. There's much to cover more, especially the lands of Jupiter, which I am going to cover right in this episode. So let's trace a line that connects the parts we discovered, uh, something like this. As you can see, it's very small compared to what we did last episode, so we'll have to continue going on with this. In this case, with the lands of Jupiter. So the lands of Jupiter are literally right on the left of the lands of the Custodians, yet thanks to this indivisible barrier that exists between them, as you can see, very two different, very, very, very different uh, types of existence, the lands of Custodians are not connected really with the lands of Jupiter. You know who is connected with the lands of Jupiter? The Anunnaki lands, through this uh, basically bridge that is actually next to Mars. So what is actually the lands of Jupiter? So you know the, of the planet Jupiter, right? Yeah, everybody knows about it. But what is actually in it? What is going on with it? Well, first of all, you have to know that like Earth, there's multiple rings that exist on the lands of Jupiter. In this case, there's one major ring and everything else is less important. The major ring divides the lands of Jupiter, uh, sorry, the lands of Zeus, Zeus from everything else. And here it's where it gets crazy. Not only is Jupiter inhabited, so it has a population, but the inhabitants of Jupiter are actually uh, living beings that have common origins with the people of Earth. So while Mars, we saw there was 
differences we have martians then we had a human colony brought by the terra cimmeria so the cimmerians of ancient greece then we had the elysium and ridania also ancient greece and uh, mythology once again then even thule and thule too but in this case it's people that really uh, resemble humans but they are so different from what we remember that we could not interact with us so what is happening in the lands of jupiter first of all the lands of zeus and here it is where it gets crazy. The lands of Zeus is the head point, like the capital, of the Anunnaki's control of Jupiter. There's a divine entity, I don't know of which kind, but it has decided to come from the Anunnaki's and colonize Jupiter. So its station is in the capital, so right here, and at the same time of using it to colonize the, the lands of Jupiter and the remember the Anunnaki came to a lot of planets in the ancient times both Earth but in this case even Jupiter but the difference with Jupiter is that instead of just giving it the information or sharing things with the people of Jupiter they actually straight up tried to colonize it and what did they do they created the ring as you can see it's an imperfect ring it has a lot of divisions technically it should be really, really easy for the people in this other lands like amaltea elara europa ganymedes metis Tebe, and so on to actually reach the lands of, of, of zeus but they can't you know why because the anunnaki have taken every single important person or uh, ruler from these places and they had made them live in the lands of zeus so these places are in constant conflict with each other. Elar with Alomaltea, Ganymedes with Callisto, Ersa with Metis, and the majority of the inhabitants of the lands of Zeus are not just the Anunnaki and the rulers of these lands near them, but they are the inhabitants of Europa, in this case it's this, not the actual Europa continent for us Europeans, but the people that live in the lands of Zeus are originally from the Europa. Of course, the way the Jupiter plane of existence was um, basically ci not civilized. Uh, like the civilization expanded from Europa, then went to Ganymedes, and then went this way, and then this this way from Ganymedes, and that's how, uh, how it existed. But funnily enough, we can see that the reason all these places are in conflict is because of the Anunnaki. So the Anunnaki, every kind of like couple generations, what they do is they take leaders from all of these lands, all of these continents, all of these states, they force them to live in the lands of Zeus and make guardians or gates disappear from the ring that uh, surrounds the lands of Zeus and the outside world. So what happens is that every time these places start to develop, start to become more sufficient, more autonomous, and then <laughs> from nowhere the lands of Zeus are once again invaded by more Anunnaki, probably the descendants of these first Anunnaki's that reached uh, Jupiter and they take all the leaders, all the people that are getting these places better and they force them to live in the lands of Zeus. The lands of Zeus once again becomes the capital of the entire planet, it keeps getting richer, it keeps getting important, while the rest are forced to go to war with each other because every time they blame each other for what is happening. They don't know which of them is doing all of this, and since there is no connection, no way to connect, as you can see there is barely any water, all of this is unlivable land, you can see, you know, Jupiter is not really livable, and uh, so they have no connection with each other, so they know, don't know what is going on. They only have some small collections to, uh, through their vicinity, so you can see Pandya is next to Tebe, uh, Adraste is next to Tebe again, Amaltea is next to both Europa and Tebe, Elar is basically divided from everybody, so it's probably not one that goes to war very often, but they always blame each other. I think we can reflect about it on our world too. So this is the lands of Jupiter. Then we have the lands of angels. Uh, I am not sure once again of what the lands of angels are, but if I were to probably take a wild guess, it's probably where the angels reside. You know how the angels are on a separate uh, realm of existence, while they are, of course, both where, of course, both on the Ancestral Republic and, of course, Earth itself. So they come visit Archangel Gabriel, Archangel Michael, and so on and so forth they probably have their own plane of existence, so the lands of angels. Also, the lands of Uriel. It would probably be the Archangel Uriel, which was one of the most ancient angels in biblical history. Probably called 
the, probably the land is called through them and is where they inhabit it. So once again, the real rulers of the lands of angels are the angels themselves. God knows where God himself is, though. Then we have Aldebaran. Aldebaran is another plane of existence. It's divided in Aldebaran A and Aldebaran B, both having their own source of light, but being very different one from the other. While Aldebaran A is where the life is, as you can see even from the colors of the land, this place has plains, this place has mountains, this place has hills, this place has grasslands. The other hand, Aldebaran B is not the same case. Uh, the first thing you will notice is that itself has uh, one ring that surrounds the major part here, and then more lands next to it. Well, the Aldebaran A is all connected with no rings inside it. And this is pretty funny because, as you can see, it's one ring, then one ring here. So it's two rings. This map goes everywhere every time I actually try to move it around. So it's two rings. Okay, where am I? Uh, so it's two different rings inside of other rings. Inside of another ring, which is the Aldebaran ring. Uh, Aldebaran is not inhabited by any human life forms, but there are some theories that include basically what are aliens at this point, or some other humanoid species living in Aldebaran A, while Aldebaran B uh, probably inhabited by no one because of the harsh conditions. Uh, there might be some life inside of this small circle, maybe some fauna or some flora, maybe some other kind of non-carbon-based uh, life. We're not really sure. It's one of the mysteries when it comes to Aldebaran, uh, but cannot be really explained. Uh, then we have the lands of Osiris. I'm not sure if I already caught, no, I don't cover the lands of Osiris. Uh, this is probably easy to just translate. Osiris is where the god Osiris uh, uh, lives. Osiris being once again one of the gods of ancient Egyptian uh, mythology. Uh, you can see that it's very, very close to Earth, so it's even close to Geminia. Uh, so just like a simple path, you can show it from here to here. And it's also relatively uh, close to the lands of Seth and the, la and the Sea of Horus, probably through some sort of spatial um, um, uh, distortion. You can probably go from Osiris to the Sea of Horus without any trouble. So, then we have ESES. -ES. I'm not gonna say it fully because these days it's associated with another thing, which in this case it is not. It's, of course, the goddess uh, of that name, and another goddess in ancient Egyptian mythology, once again, one of the very important ones, and they are, um, they are surrounded by the Anubis Islands, which are uh, not mentioned anywhere else, which actually makes sense. If you don't know, this is actually pretty interesting. So Anubis, you know, god of death in ancient Egyptian mythology. What the Anubis Islands are, are the literal... Uh, factual version of what happens in the different passages that accompany the soul once it reaches the afterlife. So it is very convoluted and complicated to explain, but the ancient Egyptians believed that uh, a person's soul, after their bodily uh, existence ended, so they died, uh, their soul, most likely the part known as the Akh, would travel to the underworld, also known as Duat, and receive judgment. So how this happened was that Anubis uh, was going to judge the person through a Libra, which would have a soul on like a heart on one side and a feather on the other part, a feather from Ma'at, which was the goddess of truth, balance, justice, harmony, and many other concepts. So the soul would be weighed, and if the soul weighed more than the feather of Ma'at, then it will go to the bad parts of the lands of, Anub of the islands. When I say that the bad ones would go to the bad parts of the lands of An the islands of Anubis, I literally don't mean they would go anywhere. Realistically, they would just be transported to where Amit lived. Amit being the, the like the creature that ended the souls of the evil, and the souls of the evil would be literally devoured by this creature, which was basically some sort of mix of different animals. It was a part lion, part hippopotamus, and the head of a crocodile, and so on and so forth. And these souls would never enjoy reincarnation or eternal life or any other kind of anything. So probably the souls 
that go to the Anubis Islands have to go through all of this once again, while the ones that go to probably the other places we mentioned already have a lot of different things to go for. We also have a lot of other places here in the third ring of Earth that I did not mention earlier because of the low quality of the map I was looking at last time. Uh, so one of the things here, we can see the birds, Admiral Birds Strait here from the third ring that brings to uh, the lands of Mars, which we already covered in the last episode. Uh, I could not see it last time because of the low quality. Then next to Atlantis, which I did mention in the last episode, we have Lemuria. Lemuria being one of the continents that was hypothesized to be uh, next to um, like the lands from, I believe, Asia, from like in like this this this, this thing here. All right, I can't really show it correctly right now, but it's probably something close to uh, this. Lemuria was believed to be from this area here it was one of the theories that uh, explain how the people uh, from no, no not, not not the people the lemurs from the madagascar area had similar skeletons uh, found in asia some birds things like this there's a lot of theories and one of the ones was Lemuria, but it would ex eventually be explained through continental shelf moving and stuff like this, but Lemuria itself might have existed at some point because there was a Tamil legend, Tamil being the place where, well, Tamil is not a place, it's a language, but a Tamil people here, all right, that's basically it. And the, the Tamil people had a legend of also a sunken land existing here, so in this map, this is explained by another wormhole or spatial distortion that happened to transport the lands of Lemuria from the uh, no lands of Earth to the third ring next to Atlantis, which is honestly what happened, exactly what happened with Atlantis, so it's not really too crazy to believe. Here we have the Mermaid Islands, not really know what that is, probably where mermaids are supposed to be, I don't believe in mermaids, correct me if I'm wrong. Then we have the Islands of Death, uh, probably one of the upper lands where the dead go to. The Solitaire Ocean, which is literally the Pacific Ocean but three times worse, so we can see there are some islands here, so it's probably not that bad, but it is probably a solitary place, very lonely. Forgotten Island, there's a lot of them even in our own uh, known lands. Uh, Argos, Aros, already mentioned, Talos, and I, oh, oh, this is interesting actually. The hottest bridge. Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. Oh, wow, I really want, ah, man, I would have really wanted to see this last time. It was very unfortunate that I could not see it. So last time I explained about Elysium, Eridania, and how these were the places that the ancient Greeks... Wait, that's Italy. Where the ancient Greeks... That's Italy again, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where the ancient Greeks um, thought these souls would go. And I explained that Elysium was where the noble souls would go. Eridania, which is basically where the souls would wander for eternity if they were not worthy. Then there was one river, which is shown here, uh, which was the river where people could forget, called the River of Leto. And if you drank the river, the water from the River of Leto, you would forget everything and be able to reincarnate. So that was what I was talking about. Also here we have Hellas Planitia, which literally means planet of Greece. So yeah, probably makes sense now. And I was talking about how it was somehow here in Mars, but I could not get a reason for this being here and not in the some part around Earth or some other like plane of existence. But instead, it is explained here by the Hades Bridge. So you know how you would go to in the underworld in Greek mythology? Well, you would probably be here in the Hades Bridge, which would eventually bring the soul to this area right here, and Charon would uh, traverse you, Charon being the uh, literal taxi driver of the ancient Greeks. Of course, it was not a taxi driver, it was a uh, like, person that had a boat and would transport you from one side of the Hades realm to the other, to meet Hades. Uh, I was just making a joke. So basically, Charon would transport you here to wherever you went. So probably first you had a judgment with Hades himself, then to Elysium or Eridania, or maybe somewhere even worse. Probably in the mouth of Cerberus, maybe. So that's probably gonna be it for this episode. 
Let's trace a line through the places we discovered next. So the lands of Jupiter, the lands of the angels. Oh wait, also Aldebaran. Gonna forget that. Can't forget that. Uh, also Aldebaran too. Then we checked the lands of Osiris. And uh, what what is this? Oh, the lands of Orion. I did not see the lands of Orion. Probably gonna do it in the next episode if it keeps getting support. Um, yeah, this is probably all we covered this episode. So uh, basically the same amount of last episode. If we keep going like this, we might finish the map. But once again, this map is huge. There's a lot of unknown zones that uh, Nosconfundum Confundum himself might expand on. So we might get more information as we go on. And I will keep trying to do my best of my research. It's very complicated, especially when uh, there's just not that much knowledge and the rest of the world to have but uh, yeah i will keep going my, uh, doing my research like for the lands of jupiter i was very lucky that noscom from them himself released a video where he explained what they were about so there's very literally first source information when it comes to the lands of jupiter and everything else yeah so thank you for watching i hope we can see each other in the next episode if this video that i'm posting right now reaches around three thousand views and four days, I'll probably make, make a third part as well. So, thanks for watching and see you next time.